Hi everybody, glad you're with us today. Today I'm chatting with Ollie. He's an aquatic physiotherapist from Eastbourne and Ollie and I have met each other at various conferences and a training course. Um, Ollie did the aqua stretch course with me at Headley Court, so that was when we first met. So um, get yourselves comfy, grab yourselves a cup of tea, cup of coffee or a glass of wine, dependent upon what time of day you're actually watching this and uh, sit down and enjoy whilst I have a chat with Ollie about his um, career in aquatic therapy. So hi Ollie. Hi there Linda, thanks for inviting me to do a little talk today. <laughs> You're very welcome, <laughs> very welcome. Um, so Ollie, you've, uh, as I said, you're a physiotherapist and you specialise in aquatics, but how did your journey start? Um, so in uh, 2008, I qualified as a physiotherapist and during my training, I worked, I did a placement, a one month placement with at Haywards Heath with a lady called Jackie Patman. Uh, Jackie Patman is an extremely, um, uh, he's, she, well, she's a world expert in aquatic physiotherapy. She's uh, extremely knowledgeable. She's a lovely person. She's brilliant with the patient. She, her clinical skills are second to none uh, in my experience uh, since, since then. And it was just pure luck, really, that I got a, place, a placement with her. Um, and she left the last in legacy with me. So, I, you know, I just really, really enjoyed myself. It was uh, the stuff that you could do with the patients was phenomenal. And, um, and then from there, I went to, I, I qualified. I did my uh, junior placement and then moved to um, a hospital called Burswood, um, where, I can, where they had a hydrotherapy pool. And I was in there for three hours a day every day for, for five years. And then since then did lots of different ad hoc um, aquatic physiotherapy and then, and then went from there. So I think that what we tend to find is that with the aquatic side of this industry, it's something that you fall into. It's not mm. necessarily something that you start your journey going, this is what's going to happen. It's either somebody or something that has that influence that makes you sort of become really, really passionate about it. Mm. And I always say with myself, it's, it's a career I fell into not one that I chose, it chose me because of the diversity of what was happening um, during those times. So, so when, you were, um, when you started doing your physiotherapy, was there any particular area of interest that you, um, you sort of like got drawn to initially? Um, so, well, when you first qualify as a physiotherapist, you do something called a junior rotations where you work in different areas in neurology, neurology respiratory. I was in intensive care for a few months, four months and um, outpatients, which is musculoskeletal. So it, it's kind of you've got to keep an open mind when you first start. But then when I moved to Burswood with the aquatic physiotherapy, I um, probably 70% of my caseload was neurological physiotherapy. Mm -hmm. working with people with multiple sclerosis, uh, stroke, um, Parkinson's disease. It tended to be the long-term conditions, um, motor neurons disease as well, as well as uh, um, some sports injuries, muscul musculoskeletal stuff, our backs and knees and elbows and shoulders and things. Um, but a great deal of my case was with the um, neurological conditions. And we had a um, very close links with a consultant neurologist uh, locally and he managed to get some funding from um, from a pharmaceutical company for for a, a project to do with multiple sclerosis um, so I ended up doing a research project for people with multiple sclerosis um, and it got published um, and um, uh, yeah and it, it did quite well we won we won a, an award called the kudos award um, for it and it was basically trying to show that aquatic therapy is beneficial to people with multiple sclerosis. It wasn't an original research. It wasn't a random randomized controlled trial or anything because you just can't do that for people with multiple sclerosis. There's lots of different, well, you can, of course, but it's difficult to do it in aquatic physiotherapy because so it would be such uh, an individual. So yeah, um, that's kind of what I was into. Okay. Well, uh, multiple sclerosis is one of those conditions that you quite often get to see when you're doing group exercise classes uh, not obviously as they get sort of progress too far down the line but uh, initial phasing or um, when they've got the sort of relaxing remitting 
So are there any sort of like hints or tips that you can give for people or any other sort of like neurological condition, like we have strokes that also come into the pool. So is there any, any kind of tips that you can give to people that they can take into account? Yeah, so um, people with multiple sclerosis, I mean, first things first, it's uh, uh, no, no individual is the same. Uh, in, in general, but especially with multiple sclerosis, there's so many different, there's such a range of conditions that people can have, a range of abilities um, or disabilities. And it, and so group work is, is quite hard actually because everybody's slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a few um, symptoms that is quite common for, for people with relapse remitting or people with primary progressive, secondary progressive. Uh, parts of their condition that means that the progressive is unfortunately their start their their ability is starting to reduce um, and the rats remitting their the ability starts to reduce and then they they can improve uh, so it depends on which phase someone is in in rats remitting but the common symptoms is fatigue uh, which is a huge problem actually I'll talk about that in a second and then another one is heat as well that some people are very heat sensitive most people tend to be hot heat sensitive um, if it's a really hot day or in the summer they, they hate it their fatigue levels increase if and their ability reduces as their fatigue in, increases um, some people it's the cold so if you're working in a cold pool be aware that if they're cold sensitive to fatigue then working them hard in the cold pool is actually going to be problematic for them or potentially problematic because their, their fatigue would be even worse just by standing in the water um, and you imagine if they're in the cold water, there be you have to exercise them to intensity to keep themselves warm, which again has to be high enough intensity, which will also fatigue them. So fatigue is a big thing. And bear in mind, some people don't mind it as much, but it is a big symptom. And if they are fatigued for two or three days after one 45 minute aquatic therapy session or 30 minute aquatic therapy session, that you know, it's just the, the quality of life's are you getting the same amount of gains if then if they can exercise regularly so um and that's the same with hot pools and mainly i work in hot pools but bear in mind heat hot pools are usually kept at third between 33 and 36 degrees celsius which is below core temperature so actually they will fatigue to start off with in a hot pool but it would be the exercise that makes them fatigued rather than the heat Every, i've only seen like two people out of hundreds and hundreds of people i saw that actually had a the adverse effect of the heat it was more the exercise but coming to the fatigue side of things it's okay to work people hard in the pool that's how they make physiological changes um, but you have to be more mindful with fatigue for people with ms as i said if you flare up someone's fatigue that you've worked in quite hard and they're they're unable to move for a few days afterwards then you know you've got to ask yourself is that too much and it probably is because they're not physically doing anything else for yeah. the next few days. So any changes you've made in the 30 minute, 40 minute pool session is not going to be, it's not going to be carryover effect on land and they, and they live and exist on land. So you got to, that's the whole point of that. So that's my tips on MS to, to boil. It sort of works with a lot of, because there's other, there's other conditions as well that fatigue mm. has a, a big impact on. Mm. You know, because that resistance is 360 degrees, a lot of people don't think about that every movement they make is going to be against resistance. Whereas if you go to the gym, you might do sort of three sets of 10 or, or whatever the repetitions are, but then you'll get up and you'll have a drink while you walk to the next piece of equipment. So you're sort of having a bit of a rest then. And, and also the gym equipment is sort of focusing on one muscle group. Whereas when we're in the pool, course you you're working the whole time against that resistance so you can sort of build up those fatigue levels relatively quickly in, in some of those conditions yeah and what you've also got to remember with the fatigue is the it's a neurological fatigue so the worst that someone who suffers with the neurological fatigue whether that that happens in stroke parkinson's multiple sclerosis it seems to be more prevalent in multiple sclerosis but as chronic, chronic fatigue syndrome or me um if you said to them, oh, you, you know, they they'll say to you, "I feel tired. I'm, I'm exhausted today." And then, and then you say to them, "Oh, yeah, I've had a bit of a bad night's sleep as well." It's it, it's like a, almost people are personally insulted by that statement because it's not the same tiredness. And um, the metaphor you, you that, I, that I've been told that 
from people that experience this is that they imagine that you a tank of petrol a, a car you know if you, if the petrol runs out the engine stops that's what they feel like well people who don't suffer with with that chronic fatigue uh, that neurological fatigue that our little engine like uh, you know the little uh, light that goes on the dashboard to say the petrol that's when we feel tired we've got a buffer yeah but they, but they don't they'll when when so, i've never seen anything like it when i've worked someone in the pool when i first started uh, with people multiple stress so i worked and uh, did some exercise with them didn't think it was too taxing at all but they could they they couldn't walk out of the changing room they, they were they they could their legs didn't work and that that was scary as a matter of fact so you've got and it's and dangerous be very careful we were in a controlled environment so you know this i was working one-to-one -one and i could get out of the pool we had a poolside assistant working with us all the time on the side of the pool they were very helpful um family members were there to help get them in we had we were in a hospital so we had a wheelchair that we could bring with them to them to get them back into the car they could get home okay and safely but you know in a in a normal pool you wouldn't have that support no. so it's, uh, you, yeah you've got to be you've got to be very careful with that and as i said it's a neurological fatigue it's not like just w w when we feel tired so that's something it's profound really um and do they have um do they have a sort of warning system or does it go from like hero to zero so they it, yeah, it can, yeah. suddenly it's completely and it's just like you said that within w with people that suffer this fatigue they often say that they don't know when it's happening it doesn't happen at that time like they get out do the exercise they get out of the pool and then later on they they, they feel fatigued afterwards yeah uh, I, it's uh, it's a, almost a bizarre thing like we would feel if i went for a run i would stop because i feel tired but uh um yeah it's, okay. it's they, they don't they can't interesting, interesting. yeah yes <laughs> my dogs my dogs um it's your dog. Come and say, come say hello. Come and say hello, but he's he's kind of demanding attention. Is it? <laughs> yeah, got... Let me show you to the most people on the on Facebook. No, he'll come back in a minute. I'll, I'll pick him up and show him to you. In a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so what other sort of conditions do you like to work at with them with people? Um, I've seen like every single condition. So the neurological patients is fantastic for. So yeah. um, I've seen many people, uh, cerebral palsy, for example, or, or stroke, someone's paralyzed down one side or someone who can't walk, who's in a permanent wheelchair. I mean, can, can you imagine? I've also seen people with um, learning difficulties as well, who are physically um, disabled as well. And, you know, cognitively, um, special educational needs adults and, and they're maybe in a wheelchair so when they when you get them in a pool how wonderful can you, you can just imagine how wonderful that would be yeah absolutely. So anything and it when he's paralyzed someone, someone who's sort of their hands up here because they've got had a stroke and they're, they're they're very tight in their muscles being in a warm pool and all of a sudden their arm feels a little bit more feels more relaxed and they're floating and they and they can swim themselves bearing in mind you know very few people can actually not swim even if yeah. they've got no leg control or one side of their body's paralyzed we even we've had people that are um i've seen people with um a broken neck so they're completely paralyzed from the head down so when they're lying on their back in the pool they, they're floaty because they don't have very much muscle mass so they tend to be buoyant people so they're floating on their back in the water and if they tuck, tuck their chin down their legs start to drop down as they tuck their chin up their legs start to float float up so it's the changing changing the angles and the movement so what they can do is they can just gently swim Excellent. Like, a, like almost like a dolphin going through just gently not far but but it's just a wonderful relief for them their, their neck muscles relax and i mean i think that freedom that freedom mm -hmm. you get because it's probably the only time a person like that can actually move independently on their own. So yeah. there's a whole emotional release going oh, on. Everything like that. And then, but then also the, the more standard conditions, I would say standard, but you know, people with back pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, fantastic. It's fantastic for range of movement. It's fantastic for, to improve strength, quality of movement. Quality of movement is brilliant. Quality and control. 
so I really like working for people with back pain, for example. Yeah. I've seen lots of athletes with back pain. Well, any sorts of pain. And you can do stuff in the pool that you just cannot do on land. Uh, I can explain that later on if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the fact that they can actually also start to do their rehabilitation much earlier because you get people that are non-weight bearing to start with. I mean, I get, because of where I work, it's sort of on the grounds of Stanmore Orthopaedic Hospital. Mm. the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital as some people know it but because of being there and the leisure centres right next to it we do get a lot of orthopaedic patients sort of come in and working their early rehab in the pool so it's mm. amazing it's, it's so lovely to see to see these you know and and I think also if you come into the pool and you they're coming in on crutches and they're walking and they're getting their gait cycle to sort of rehab. Mm quicker you haven't got that sort of neurological adaptation that comes from walking limps and using crap using sticks and things like that you can actually you know reprogram them so much quicker yeah post orthopedic surgery is fantastic it really is knee replacements and things like that for all sorts of reasons yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely it's excellent excellent okay so um what did you just say a minute ago i'll tell you more about that in <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, like for, for, for quality and control of movement. So um, that's using something called the metacentric effect, where yes. the relationship between buoyancy and center of gravity, where um, it has gravity go. Your gr Lots of people say in the pool that gravity doesn't work in the pool. Well, it does. Otherwise, the pool water would be flying everywhere. It's just the fact that it's offloaded by the buoyancy of your body yeah. up thrust. So that equal and opposite forces that go down the, the water buoyancy is going up of your body and then the pressure going down through your centre of gravity or your gravity from normal gravity. And that relationship, if you imagine the end of my fingers, uh, if one of those, that buoyancy is slightly to one side, it will, it will tilt you this way because you're off balance. So you can use that to affect. Now, not everybody's body is... is completely symmetrical we're a, we're all a little bit wonky and there's nothing wrong with being wonky you know <laughs> uh it's all it's all good but the but if you like for example sit on a load of uh, two or three kickboards those those little flat floats mm -hmm. you sat on them and you put your arms you know norm, normally people wiggle their hands around and kick their legs to use their hands as balance but if you put your hands across your chest and don't move your arms and put your feet together so you can't use your legs you have to then move your body and it's all off balance and you've got to try and keep those floats underneath you you can utilize that metacentric effect in so many different ways and it's brilliant for control because if you don't have control it, the water's unforgiven it will just flop you, flip you over yeah. and the great thing about the water is you don't have the inhibition of falling because if i for example sat on a, uh, a you know these great big gym ball things Swiss ball or gym ball, yeah. inflatable ball. If I sat on that, my brain is saying, well, I don't want to fall off it because um, I might hit my head on the wall or something like that or on the floor. So you're gonna, your muscles aren't gonna be relaxed when you, you're never gonna push yourself to the limit of balance because the only time you can actually improve your balance and control is by almost falling over. <laughs> Uh, almost falling over yes, yes. So it's falling over but in the pool you can do that and it's so easily because it doesn't matter if you get your hair wet well for most people i did i have seen people. you want to work where i work it really matters to some <laughs> yeah, it does yeah it does yeah I, I have experienced that before yeah <laughs> i do if someone's had a recent haircut and a dye or something like that yeah, yeah. And but it is good though because you can you can really balance you can really sort of feel like you're falling and balance and you've got it and it's really it, if you stick enough kickball on me here it's, it, no matter who you are you could be a professional athlete it's going to be extremely difficult to keep them underneath you yeah so uh, so that's a type of control exercise I, I love that sort of stuff it's brilliant it works really well it it's the it's the how working all the muscles as a team rather than just strengthening one yes um, absolutely that's that's the balance side of things and that's good for neurological conditions and for people with all sorts of other conditions you can do the same with leg put your the floats under your foot so your foot's got to balance so so keeping the control of those floats um and then also the strengthening exercises the 
using flippers, the, the drag effect. Um, so uh, the, using the resistance of the water, if I put someone, a pair of flippers on someone's feet and ask them to kick their feet forwards and backwards, of, again, obviously that's going to be harder than just their normal foot. And you can really apply the resistance all the way through the range of movement. So you, you, if, I, if you're standing up and you, you're standing on a step so that the flippers foot is off the step so it, it can go all the way through, you can generate an awful lot of torque and a lot of resistance throughout the entire movement of hip flexion and extension. So you can really get, you can not only increase, generate more power and strength, and it is more power rather than just pure strength because it's speed through, through, through that muscle contraction. The faster you go, the harder the contraction. Um, but you've also got to work control and quality of movement as well, as well as all the way through. So yeah, I really, I like it for many reasons. And you just cannot generate that, that especially that metacentric balance effect. You cannot generate that same on, on land, no chance. There's no, nothing like it, no one near. No, no. Um... As you say, you don't sort of hurt yourself when you fall. Like you know, I use that a lot when I'm working with the older um, population and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, as we get older, we tend to shuffle more as the eyesight diminishes, as the hearing diminishes, the sort of gait starts to get smaller and smaller. But you can go into the pool and, mm -hmm. you know, even without the flippers, you can be kicking mm -hmm. the leg backwards and forwards and they still got to balance and stabilise on the other leg because you're creating all that turbulence and the eddies and everything. Mm -hmm around that stationary limb so yeah i used to love doing that it, yeah it gets someone just to stand with their feet close together and that's someone who's not quite steady on their feet and just walk around them just walk past them and say come on you know and obviously the eddies suck suck the eye cores suck them behind me um and they, they fall over and they can't believe it it's like well look you didn't even touch me <laughs> but yeah. you're using the water to generate that force that then when you, when you keep doing that after a while, they'll, they'll be able to react. Because some people, when they fear of falling is a big thing, that's a brilliant thing to do in, the high, in, a, a, in, in any pool. Because you're, you know, f um, lots of people, if they fear of falling, they, they kind of tense up and then they'll fall like a, like a tree, like a you know, timber. <laughs> and um, you can see my Bristolian accent coming out there, timber. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so but but when you do that in the pool they'll learn to put their foot back you know like to stop them falling over or they'll learn to bend as they start to feel like they're going backwards they've got time because it happens slower in a pool so like lean forwards to to prevent them going backwards so you can work on these balance mechanisms yeah. in a more controlled environment it is but the thing is at the end of the day it is slower in the pool yeah does that transfer on land eventually it will do but you've got also, I think, you you know, it, it, there's a lapse where you need to start practicing a little bit on land as well in a controlled environment. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But one of the nice things as well is I think, with, again, talking sort of older population, you can get them to sort of like learn about turning again, because again, sort of they sort of shuffle around as they turn, you know, mm. sort of, and you think, well, if you... So there's traffic lights change and you're halfway across, you've got to pick up some speed. And if someone calls your name, the grandchildren, and you want to turn, you don't want to do it in 10 steps. You want to be able to turn. So you sort of like, you know, I think training those sorts of things in the water, it's phenomenal. And yeah. so then it needs to transfer onto the land. So it's a lovely way of putting it. Yeah, that is a good way. <laughs> Brilliant. That's how the people, they, people learn in context, don't they? So yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. yeah. Well, definitely. I definitely learn in context. So, you know, so that's when the petty, yes, you know, that's, that's how we live our lives. So mm. that's, that's what we need to do. Yeah, that's a good point though, because that's one of the drawbacks of the pool environment um, is that it isn't, they live their life on land. So does it transfer onto land? And that's the difficult thing to prove. So any research that anyone wants to do out there, um, please see if it transfers on land because we, we, we know it does. It might take a little bit longer, but um, that's that's the difficult thing to prove. Anyway, there we go. Well, you, you say it might take a little bit longer, and I 100% agree with that. But I'd also just like to throw in the fact that would they actually do that training on land? So you might have something that takes longer.
transfer on land, but they're prepared to go through the motions in the pool as opposed mm. to getting somebody to do some training on land and then not actually do it at all. So I think you've, you've got yeah. that side of things as well to sort of take into account. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, as, as you can imagine, I'm a big advocate of any kind of aquatic therapy. Um, it's, it's good to know all, all sides though, isn't it? I suppose what, what some of the challenges are within it and transferring onto land-based side of things is one of the challenges we do face. That's why, um, you know, a lot of aquatic therapy pools in hospitals are being condemned and closed down, um, essentially to, you know, for, for various reasons, but one of the, one of the highest ones is probably to save money. You know, we need to, um, aquatic therapy needs to um, justify the cost that involves running a pool. You know, all leisure centres have the same thing. Pools are expensive. But anyone who works in the environment will be able to tell you the benefits of it. It's just how can we convince commissioners? How can we convince people, finan financiers who don't always have the understanding and knowledge or experience of it? So, I think that I think there's a couple of things. I think what um, one of the things that I have sort of I suppose looked into and looked at is that actually the cost of running a pool, pool buildings haven't really changed in hundreds of years, and most of the, the pools at hospitals are very very old and old fashioned. And now, having sort of looked at some of the, because uh, again, hydro pools don't tend to be very big at the hospitals. So looking at some of the more modern, like endless pools and um, some of the sort of spa pools, the hydro pools and everything, the actual insulation now is so much better that, that maintaining those temperatures is actually relatively cheaper. I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't know the costs on a comparison size to size, but when you look at them, they're, they're nowadays the, that sort of aspect of things is a lot more efficient. But also, um, I mean, the, at the, the leisure centres, when you look at all the group exercise classes, it's well known that actually the biggest attendance, the most regular attendance in any leisure centre are the aqua classes. They have the biggest numbers and the highest waiting list. So it does, you know, it does work and people do want it. Mm. But it's just, as you say, it's sort of the people that hold the purse strings are finance people as opposed to being probably even people people, but looking at what actually the benefits are by people being in the pool. You know, lots of times that you'll do a class and people will turn around and say, I can't go to yoga anymore. I can't go to Pilates anymore. I definitely can't do Zumba. And, you know, I can't do sort of some of the aerobic things. I can't get down on my knees. But what I can do is I can get into the pool and jump around like I'm 16 years old again and have an amazing, you know, amazing time, an amazing class, and that will keep my fitness going and, you know, keep, keep me going. I mean, I, I don't know about yourself, but sort of when we came back from the first lockdown, the, the amount of time it took to sort of get people's bodies back to where they were, and myself, I, I found that when I was teaching the classes, my balance was rubbish. It took me a couple of weeks to actually be able to balance again. So I think, you know, it's, it is very short-sighted of people to actually, um, unfortunately, close down the pools. But we know I'm, I'm championing that. <laughs> oh, no, and so, so am I, and so is the ATACP. We've got, you know, all sorts. The ATACP, Aquatic Therapy Association Charter Physiotherapists, have got a pool design document. Uh, you can go on their website, you can um, join even if you're not a physiotherapist, a physiotherapist um, as an associate member, come, come along to study days and things. And, um, you know, they, they, they work very, very hard, the executive committee, so some of the members of the, to, to, to do this pool design document. But, um, you know, we're, we're constantly fighting pool closures and, and it's very difficult to, to demonstrate um, the not demonstrate it's easy to get we, we, we need to get as much evidence and actual written down evidence official evidence well constructed evidence to show that it has a, a good economic cost as well as it's good for people 
And like you said, with the with those classes, they're fully booked. The um, aquatic therapy classes that you or aqua exercise classes you run, fully booked. But then a finance, uh, you know, um, uh, accountant would just say, right, okay, so that's how much we get in and how much do we get out. But then that Pilates class is in in a studio that doesn't cost anything to run, you know, other than the lights and the heating, which is going to be a lot less than heat in the pool. Uh, and they and they see double the or see an awful lot of people as well. What what you know? What's the, you know? That's that's the decisions that they make. It, I suppose it's different in the leisure industry because you could see more people. But um, we d we in in uh, hospitals, it's mainly one to one. But you get someone who's just been on intensive care, for example, for three months, who who's got a tracky tube in their in their neck, so they can't um, swallow or they don't, they need help breathing. You can get someone like that in a in a hydrotherapy pool. So they've got their pipe coming out to the side. With where the machine is they've got other health professionals around them so they're able to move their legs kick their legs so they're high risk people that can get they can get into the pool um there's all sorts of conditions like that you know uh, little old edith who's got dementia or something like that who's on the ward who's not able to walk up and down stairs to, to go home get they can come down to the hydrotherapy pool to get them a bit more a bit stronger that they just wouldn't be able to do on the wards well, not as easily anyway on the walls. So there's all sorts of different um, applications. And I, I know I'm going to it for the physio mind, the acute side of things, but still the long-term rehabilitation is equally as important. I, you know, I've seen someone who, who had a stroke 10 years ago. Um, now he just did a few sessions of uh, um, uh, aquatic therapy and was able to swim independently. So he used to go to the pool on his own three times a week, swim, swim 64 lengths. Of a 25 meter pool on his own he's paralyzed on one side and then and and that was so his quality of life his risk factors later on was so much better it didn't obviously it can't change his paralyzed side because that's a brain injury but he, he was able to move easier it's more balanced he was at less risk of having heart heart conditions further strokes and essentially that would mean i, I hate to say it, a less of a burden on NHS services because then he wouldn't have to go and see the GP as often, to change his medications as often. He'd be less likely to fall over and break his hip, where then he would spend a week in hospital, which costs what eighty thousand pounds or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's that's the re-enablement, the long-term rehab. But it's difficult to get to put that into a, a research project or a, a official evidence. It's all anecdotal at this moment in time. So that's what we need to do: is get more research evidence <laughs> it is i mean it, it, it you know one of the things that i say about myself is i'm a rest of life specialist and it is those people like you're saying you know the person that had the stroke if you can help somebody to that's got um a side of the body that's not working so well for whatever reason but by being in the pool you can sort of just ease those muscles a little bit, you know, we were talking earlier about the neurological conditions, then it's going to make dressing them easier, which is probably going to make their partner or their carer have an easier life as well. So it's sort of the actual implications of quality of life, not only for that person, is phenomenal. And I think these, these are things, that, again, we can't underestimate. But as we said, it is the people that hold the purse strings that... <laughs> That people like they like numbers so you can't you got to try and put a number on someone's quality of life or that yeah. you, you, you know you can't do it no i just said about difficult the, the, the difference is just with multiple sclerosis the different symptoms of it it's, it's really difficult to do a research project like that because you can't put a number on someone no. you do it before and after but that's not a randomized controlled trial you can't get the same things twice anyway so are, are we gonna are we gonna see a lot more covid patients in the pool because you know from being in the bed for the amount of time that some of them are you know in the hospitals and things they're going to need a very gentle way of rehabilitating and coming back to walking uh, initially so are, are we going to be seeing some of those coming into our into our pools and into our world perhaps perhaps yeah very interesting and that's the thing q tag have shown that the that pools kept uh, um having a higher chlorine level 1 1.5 i think it is um it, it's demonstrated to kill coronavirus you're effectively in bleach you know the chlorine of a pool is, is not that dissimilar to bleach so 
So yeah, um, it's actually quite a safe environment. I mean, the change rooms before and afterwards might be a bit more tricky, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's a safe environment once you're actually in it. Um, of course, you've got to wear all the PPP and stuff because that's the bit that's not in the water, but you know, washing your hands, you just dip them in the water, you know. Anyway, I don't know about the coronavirus, but yeah, maybe, maybe we'll see more people. Mm. Right, Ollie. I'm going to have to stop us there. Are you up for doing a part two at some point? Yes, if there's anyone wants to ask, um, ask any questions on, on the Facebook and the comments below, then please do. I'll see if I can answer anything. Um, and uh, well, well, we'll get you back, Ollie, because I think this conversation can go a lot further than it has done because we have the, the interesting, the two sides of mm -hmm. that we both come from. So hopefully everybody can enjoy part one and we will uh, arrange for part two very soon, I hope. <laughs>